flows and inventory throughput and flow time. Okay, and so um, I think that should have completed the first ten chapters. I thought I updated that. We've already kind of talked about that. You finished chap your chapter three A homework. Um, today we're going to talk about how operational measures link to financial measures. And again, I thought that was one of the kind of surprising things about Little's Law. It's very easy for me to think about it in terms of a manufacturing environment, but it has some very interesting applications when you think about applying it to a financial environment. Okay? And so we're going to talk about, today we're going to talk about a linear process. We're going to start with something very simple, and then we're going to move to something that's a multi-step. And by linear process, so again, I think this is important that you make this connection, a linear process is one in which every flow unit goes through every step of the process. That's a linear process, okay? And those are relatively easy to solve for inventory throughput and flow time, okay? And then what we'll work on next time is a nonlinear process where every flow unit doesn't go through every uh, step of the process and how we look at that. And again, they're not hard, but it's helpful if you look at a problem and say, is this a linear problem or a nonlinear problem? And if it's a linear problem, boy, it makes the solving process relatively easy. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so we're going to today, we're going to link um, operational measures, time, inventory, and throughput to some sources of competitive advantage and see how that, how that makes a difference. Um, and so we're going to link that through Little's Law, and we're going to connect it to our financial measures, and then we're going to talk about levers for improvement. Okay? In part one, in our first lecture, we looked at those three measures. And just as a reminder, throughput, inventory, and flow time. An example of how Little's Law can apply across a variety of scenarios. Right? And so um, we looked at how we can look at it with material flow, which is what we think of when we think of a manufacturing plant. Customer flow, we had that restaurant example, right? How a customer, how long a customer is in uh, a process. Job flow, if we're talking about maybe a construction site, you know, how long does it take a particular job to move through? Cash flow, right? And accounts receivable. So, um, again, we're going to look at some straightforward linear processes today, okay? So, how can operations help a company compete, okay? Well, if we think about what's happened over time, Back in the 1960s, right, we were kind of coming out of the World War II environment, and we were pretty well, our boundaries were pretty well established. We produced what we bought here in the United States. You can have any color you want as long as it's black, right, some of the Henry Ford kind of stuff. If we produce it, they're going to buy it, right? That was the environment that we were in. Okay. And then, so that's pre-1960, and then as we get into the 1960s, we start to have this thought of, well, you know, we could do some focused factories and we could be more efficient if we focus in on certain competitive factors, okay? And um, then in the 1970s, we moved into flexible factories and product variety, okay? So a car for every taste and purse, right? So you can have low cost, high cost, you know, everything in there, okay? And then in the 1980s, we went through this quality movement where quality is free, right? Do you think we were a leader or laggard in the quality movement? Leader. You think we were what? A leader. You do? Okay. Anybody agree or disagree? I would disagree. We were a laggard. It depends on what you're talking about. Well, it's like the cars and stuff. I know the 80s cars were junk from American manufacturers like where Honda and Toyota, that's kind of where they got their foothold. But that's exactly for some right. other stuff, that's there right. was like the Japan and China weren't making that stuff with junk and the American made stuff like appliances made in the 80s and stuff are always like generally pretty good whereas like if you bought some formed appliances that were made back in the day like they weren't nearly the quality and they had like a bunch of issues with them you'd start to see that transition i think in the 70s and 80s yeah. so in the 80s we, we would see the quality coming through especially from the japanese and part of that was it goes all the way back to world war ii we had people here in the united states who had great quality thought and how we should approach what we were going to do after world war ii but they, um, the United States, we were in that whatever we make, they're going to buy. So why should we focus on quality, right? That was our, our deal was whatever we make, they're going to buy. So we're just going to make whatever we want. And we just didn't pay attention to it. And that's how the Japanese, to your point, got into our market space because they focused in on the 
the quality aspect. And the MacArthur program, right? What's that? The MacArthur program, where he like took all the American business plans over there after World War II, and we like helped rebuild them. I still couldn't hear. The MacArthur plan, like where they like rebuilt Japan. Right, right. With our so, business plans. So we had some folks who like during World War II did some great things in the in the military with quality, and then after that there was no there was no space for them in our marketplace in terms of, or there was a better space for them. They were more desired in the Japanese culture, so that's where they ended up going. So we ended up helping support and build their quality culture, which I always think is so interesting. Then now that we're on that. Um, so in the 80s, and this is when I was where you're at, right? I was coming out of, um, so in 1987, I'm graduating from Iowa State University, and I go to work for a transportation company, and we're having this whole quality is free conversation, right? And um, the reason that people say that is because if you think about the errors that happen on a manufacturing one, let's just stick with manufacturing because that's simple in terms of visualizing things, okay? So you have these errors that are going on, and so you have to rework, right? So there's cost associated with rework, okay? And if your quality is poor and you send it to your customer, right, there's um, service calls that have to be done. <clears throat> there's uh, lack of customer support, right? And you have people like Taguchi is one of the famous quality guys, and he would say that quality is completely free. And I disagree with that. There is a point where you have diminishing returns, right? The more effort and energy you put into your quality program, it may not pay off for you in the long run. Taguchi would tell you that's not true. That every every ounce of dollars and cents that you put into the quality program is going to come back to you, okay? But you have to understand from a quality perspective, you have to understand what your customer wants, and then you have to make sure that you're meeting those needs. So from a competitive advantage, it's about understanding what levels you have to hit. I'll give you the, an example for quality, um, the glass that we would get in. Um, so are you going to say that every piece of glass that comes in can't have a single mar, scratch, or blemish in it? Or is there some criteria that you're going to live by to say this is our quality? Because I'm telling you, you can hold up any piece of light or any piece of glass to this light, right, and you can find a blemish in it. So you have to be specific. So our our standard was, can you see the blemish in natural light at three feet, right? And I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times in my career we took a piece, a pane of glass outside, stood in natural light, and asked somebody to come look that didn't know where the blemish was at and go, can you, do you see an issue here? And if they say no, you go, okay, well, we can use that piece of glass, right? But you can't do it inside factory lighting because you can see every blemish that's going to come through. And you can't have the person that found it to begin with go out in the natural light. Yeah, see, it's right there, right? So there's there's that. But from a quality is free standpoint, Taguchi would say, we have to figure out ways to eliminate all those blemishes, right? And I think that there's this kind of a trade-off at some point you reach um, where you have the diminishing returns, okay? Um, in the <clears throat> late 1980s and 1990s, we love your product, but where is it? You don't sell what you produce, you produce what sells, okay? Um, so again, I think notes that I had was U.S. was behind Japan in the quality revolution. Some of the top quality gurus in the U.S. started um, and then moved to Japan because we didn't buy into the need to improve quality, okay? All right. So why do we say that inventory throughput and flow time right, can be an economic value add? Okay, so this is a pretty... Um, common, you probably saw something like this in 343, right, where we talked about um, how how operations measures translate into financial metrics, okay? So if we start on this side of it, our economic value add, right, one leg of it is profit and the other leg of it here is opportunity cost. Our profit is the difference between our revenues and our costs, okay? So our improvement levers over here, we can increase price, right, or we can increase the volume that goes through that. If we're going to increase the revenues, right, those are the two levers. Increase the price or increase the throughput to get more revenue, okay? If I want to reduce costs to make an improvement to my profit, right, I can reduce costs by reducing my material costs, my labor costs, my energy costs, my overhead costs, or I can improve my quality and make less rework involved in all of that, right? So that, again, is going to translate into having lower costs, right? From the opportunity cost, we look at, well, what do we have invested in inventory, okay? Um, 
if I have less money invested in inventory, okay, that means I have money available for other things. Okay? Um, and or I can reduce my capital intensity, right? Um, and so again, we're looking at how can we, how does inventory throughput and flow time translate from operational metrics into financial metrics? Because if I measure, if I give metrics in a manufacturing plant and I talk about uh, profit, right? Everybody's interested in profit, but they don't directly affect profit. If I come back and I talk about the things that they directly affect, right? Our labor costs, our material costs, right? Our quality, right? Those are things that impact the factory floor and they can understand those measures and how they then translate into that. But if you talk to them about this, they get the big picture, but they don't see how do I impact that, right? So what do I do day to day that impacts that? Okay. <coughs> All right. So our operational performance measures are then going to be flow time, throughput, inventory, process cost, and quality. Okay. And just as a reminder, we talked about the definitions of flow time, throughput, and inventory last last time. Flow time is the total time spent by a flow unit within the process boundaries. Throughput is the average number of flow units that flow through into and out of the process over a period of time, also called average flow rate. Inventory is the average number of units within the process boundaries. Okay? Process cost comes from our material, labor, energy, overhead, etc. And then quality. Quality gur gurus will say uh, that improving quality reduces the total system cost. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so here's our first linear process example, okay? So at a hospital emergency room, patients come in at a rate of 20 patients per hour, and on average are processed at that rate as well. So 20 patients per hour. Rachel, inventory, throughput, or flow time? Throughput. Throughput, all right. Help Hunter since he wasn't here. Why is that a throughput measure? Because it's our rate, it's inventory over time. Yep, so anytime we have inventory over time, right, a unit of inventory over time, we're talking about throughput. So anything is blank per hour. Right, yeah, blank per unit, or excuse me, units per hour, units per minute, units per, anytime we're talking about a rate, we're talking about thro throughput. Okay, when I draw these diagrams, I always put my throughput kind of on this front arrow and on the back arrow, because what we're saying is, 20 patients per hour are coming into the process, and 20 patients per hour are exiting the process. Okay? Patients wait in queue until they are called in for registration. After registrations, patients are taken to an inner area where they are assigned a bed, where they wait till an intern is ready to see them. On average, it is found that there are 30 patients waiting for registration. Okay? 30 patients, inventory, throughput, or flow time, Zach? Inventory. Inventory, because it's patients. That's our flow unit. Okay, that's what we're talking about, All right? So, and another 20 waiting to be seen by an intern. So again, we're saying 20 waiting to be seen by an intern is going to be um, inventory, all right? And then on average, it takes a patient 0.25 of an hour in the registration process and 0.75 of an hour with the intern. Spencer, inventory throughput or flow time? I'm sorry, what? A quarter of an hour and three quarters of an hour. Inventory throughput or flow time? Uh, flow time. There you go. All right. So, and this is the way I typically set these problems up. So I draw on here, right? I draw on my diagram in the buffer where people are waiting, right? So when you draw your diagrams where people are waiting or where your flow unit is waiting should be drawn in a triangle. Scotty? Shouldn't it be 30 minutes? <coughs> 20 waiting. Yeah, I think you're right. In fact. Let's just do that. I think you hit a letter the first time. What's that? I think you hit a letter the first time. Better, we hope. <coughs> okay, so there we go. So you've got 30 people waiting, right? 20 patients per hour ending the process, 20 patients per hour exiting the process. Okay, one of the points I was wanting to make is when you have a buffer where your flow unit is waiting, draw it as a triangle. 
your rectangles are the activities where act activity is taking place, okay? There can be some waiting time inside the activity, but generally speaking, you're saying this is where the, the action is occurring, okay? So in this process, we go <clears throat> buffer one with 30 people, registration uh, takes a quarter of an hour, then they wait, then we have 20 people waiting, and then it takes three quarters of an hour with the intern, okay? So the first step of solving a little's law uh, multi-step process is to set up your table which will have the steps listed in the column on the left hand side so buffer one registration buffer two return and totals okay um, and then create a column for each of the three pieces of information that you should be capturing you should have inventory you should have throughput and you should have flow time okay and that being said right I know that my throughput is 20 patients per hour, and those patients in a linear process are going through every step in the process. So I can enter 20 patients per hour right here, right, all the way through. Right? Then in my buffers, I know how many are actually waiting, right? So, sorry, to, we're just going to go, we're going to flip it, and then I'll fix it for the next time out, all right? So we're going to say that there are 20 patients waiting in buffer one, and that there are 30 patients waiting in buffer two. Okay, and if that's the case, right, I know two of my three pieces of information. So I can then calculate my flow time, which is inventory divided by throughput. So one. it's going to be one, right? I know I can calculate my registration. It's going to be throughput times flow time. So 20 times 0.25, right, should be five, right? And again, you can just see when I have two out of the three pieces of information, I'm just filling in the third one by using that formula, right? Don't make it harder on yourself by trying to just figure it out and jot it down. Go ahead and make the table, get your two out of three pieces of information, and then you automatically know if you've got the formulas. And I almost always write the formulas at the top just to keep myself honest. Inventory is throughput times flow time. Throughput is inventory divided by flow time. And flow time is inventory divided by throughput. And so when I get my two out of three pieces of information, I solve for the last one, okay? All right, so um, the cells with the black numbers are the information that was provided in the problem. The cells in purple are ones that we calculated. So then in a linear process, and again, I emphasize, in a linear process, when every flow unit goes through every step, if I want to know on average how much total inventory is in the system, I can just add up across all of those steps. And it works in a linear. In a nonlinear, we can't just add it up, okay? We'll show you how to deal with that next time. So again, linear is pretty straightforward in how to deal with. Same thing with flow time, right? I can just add up the time and say, well, then the total flow time of the system is three and a half hours as I add up for every step, okay? So on average, when we talk about flow, so flow time is how long does it take for a patient to enter the process till they exit the process? What we're saying with this problem is that on average, that's three and a half hours, okay? All right, so here's a second example, all right? So um, our second example, we have four patients per hour, right? And they do the patient check-in, which is an activity. It takes them five minutes. They wait. So there's two patients there. They have an initial doctor consultation at 12 minutes. The doctor requests tests for the patients. That takes five minutes. They wait again, and there's one patient waiting. And then the nurse takes the test, and that takes 30 minutes. Okay, so my question is, um, let's see, are we to Andrew? Spencer, did you, okay, so Andrew, just help us out. What's our inventory, what's our throughput for this process? Four patients per hour. Four patients per hour. Where do I have inventory listed? At the buffers. At the buffers. So I have two patients and one patient. And everything else is flow time, right, on the activities. And that is typically when you're working on a process where you have physical things happening, that's what it's going to look like. You're going to have activity times, and you're going to be able to say, it takes about this long on average for them to do that. And you're going to take a snapshot of the inventory, and you're going to count how many people or whatever your flow unit is, is in that section. Okay? All right. So then if I create my table, right, inventory, throughput, and flow time, I get all the steps listed down the left-hand side of it, okay? And I fill in the table where I have inventory at my buffers, and I have flow time at my activities, and I have my throughput across every step, right? Are they so, just going to give you throughput every time? Uh, typically they will. Okay. Yeah, typically they will. Um, because 
that's that's typically how it works in the real world too, right? You can say at the end of the day, well, we usually do, if you're in a restaurant, we usually do 600 customers a night, right? You usually have some kind of idea about how many people are flowing through your process. And then the other, the buffers and the activities, right, you have to think a little bit about how you're going to capture those, okay? All right. <coughs> input your throughput across every throughput cell in your table. Wherever you're given time of an activity, input the time in your table. Wherever you're given the number of flow units, input the flow units within that step or the inventory within that step. In almost all cases for these initial problems, so you're getting the easy ones. I'm th these are the easiest ones you're ever going to see, right? And they should feel that way a little bit, right? Okay. So you will have two out of the three pieces of information, and you're just going to need to solve for the remaining cell, right? The first year I taught this, I didn't set it up this way. And it was in, I couldn't believe how difficult it was for people to grasp what we were trying to accomplish. But if you visually look at it this way, it makes it very easy to go, what two pieces do I have and how do I solve for the third? Okay. Um, <clears throat> one step before you begin your calculations is you have to make sure that you're working in the same unit of measure. So what's the current unit of measure of the flow unit? What's our flow unit here? Emily, what's, what's our flow unit? Um, patient. So patient is our flow unit, okay? And our throughput is in patients per hour, right? And Scotty, what's our activity time in? Minutes. Right. So I can't just do the math, right? I have to do conversion to make sure I either convert the minutes to hours or the hours to minutes, okay? All right. So let's look at the next slide and we'll take a look at how then we solve for that, all right? So I typically then just add another column to convert. Right? And so my conversion is, um, throughput is going to be patients per minute, right? So we're four patients per minute, which is four patients per 60 minutes. And so that's 0 .0667 patients per minute. Okay. And then I can use that then to solve patient check-in. What's my inventory, right? It's five minutes times 0 .0667 patients per minute, okay? And the other thing that I typically do is I pick one column to solve and I, call, so, and, I, and I solve all of them in a row and then I go to the other column. And it just saves on um, clarity, I guess is what I would say. Because I'm doing inventory is equal to throughput times flow time. So I've got a blank here, throughput times flow time, 0 0.0667 times 12, throughput times flow time, 0 0.0667 times 5, right? And throughput times flow time, 0 0.0667 times 30, and I fill in these blanks, okay? All right, so in this example, Hunter, if I wanted to know how many patients were in the entire process, what can I do? Would you do, like, the through, is it like the, the inventory of the patients times? You don't have to times anything. You just have to sum them up across oh, all okay. the steps, yeah. okay? All right. All right. And then, Kaylin, if I wanted to know the time, what do I need to do? The average flow time of this process. When you do the, oh, the average flow time? Mm-hmm. Of the entire process. Same thing. The same thing? Yep. I'm going to sum it up. Okay. And I can do that because it's a linear process. Okay. All right. And so, <clears throat> at the end of the day, then, we can... Um, total those up, right? And so we have six point, basically 6.5 patients in the process on average, okay? And on average, it takes from the time a patient enters the process until they exit the process, it takes about 96.9 minutes, okay? Um, <clears throat> we can also take a look then at other you know, specific portions of the process. Let's say that I just wanted to know how long before a patient sees the doctor, all right? Well, I could then add up five patients at patient, excuse me. Um, so we have patient check-in, right, is five minutes plus 29.985 minutes that they wait, right? So that's going to be a total of 34.985 minutes or 35 minutes roughly before they see the doctor, right? And sometimes you're going to have, if you're in a service operation, you're going to have um, targets that you're trying to hit to make sure that your patients aren't waiting more than 20 minutes, more than 30 minutes, more than 40 minutes, right? It's one way that you can get to, are we meeting those targets? And you should, if you're in the service industry, have set targets to say, you know, 
at, you know, on average, we don't want people to wait more than 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but you should have a game plan of what that is, that, right? That's part of your competitive strategy, okay? <clears throat> so that's kind of the easy linear flow, okay? Now we're going to kind of move into a different look here, and we're going to tar start talking about analyzing financial flows, okay? So can be this um, process flow paradigm that we're using can be used to analyze financial flows, and we'll complete an example using three financial statements, okay? Income statement, balance sheet, and a detailed cost of goods sold, okay? What I think is interesting about this is you can do this with many public companies, right? You can go out and find this information and make comparisons across companies to see who's handling different portions of their um, dollars and cents in a better way, okay? So in this example, all values on the financial statements are in millions of dollars, and they represent end-of-year numbers, okay? Although we're going to assume that inventory figures represent average inventory in the process, okay? All right. So our objective is to determine how long it takes for a cost dollar to be converted into revenue for the organization. And for that, we need a picture of process-wide cash flows, okay? All right. So... Let me so when we're looking at so this is a detailed cost of goods sold right and it tells us inventory at the top okay so that's telling us think of inventory as a snapshot in time on average how much do we have in these different buckets right and so on average we're saying that we hold 6.5 million in raw materials for the roof we hold 15.1 million in fabrication whip, right? Uh, 8.6 million in purchase parts for the base, uh, 10.6 for the assembly whip, and 9.8 for the finished goods. That's work in progress, right? Yes. Yeah. WIP stands for work in progress. So our total inventory on average is $50.6 million. Okay. So <coughs> costs of goods sold. So cost of goods sold is a snapshot in time. Okay, this is year-end financial statements. Cost of goods sold are saying, how much did we spend across the year? So this is dollars per year, which makes it what? Throughput. Throughput, because it's, it's dollars per rate, rate right? So it's 50.1 million per year in raw materials, 60.2 in fabrication, 40.2 million per year in purchase parts, and 25.3 million in, per year in assembly, okay? So, again, when we're looking at our financial statements, inventory is going to be just that. It's our snapshot in time, on average, how much we have in inventory. How much do we have inside the process? Cost of goods sold represents our throughput, right? So if I have inventory and throughput, I can calculate flow time, right? And tell you, on average, how long a dollar spends going through this process. Yeah. Is that L and OH liability and overhead? It's labor and overhead. Labor and overhead, okay. Labor and overhead. Yep, L, L and OH is labor and overhead. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So, I typically kind of try to think about this, you know, I try to put a box around whatever process we're looking at. So, inside that box, there can be multiple steps, but generally speaking, this is, this is the process that we're looking at. And so, we said that on average, right, if I come back to the previous slide, we had 50.6 million in inventory inside that process, okay? And I had throughput, and you see these different arrows coming in for raw materials and parts, for labor and overhead, and labor and overhead and assembly. And we add up all that throughput, and it says we have $175.8 million per year flowing through the process, right? And so it's $50.6 million in inventory, $175.8 million in throughput, <clears throat> Oops, I thought we were going to get a, an answer there, I think. <clears throat> All right, so if I'm going to solve for that, I'm going to take inventory divided by throughput is $50.6 million divided by $175.8 million per year. Tells me that that's 0.288 of a year if I finish that math, okay? <clears throat> I'm going I'm to show you here where I've actually done that, right? And so... It's 0.288 of a year times 52 weeks per year gives us 14.97 weeks. So what we're saying is, on average, 
The average dollar invested in the factory spends roughly 15 weeks before it leaves the process through the door of the finished goods inventory warehouse. Or on average, it takes roughly 15 weeks for a dollar invested in the factory to be billed to a customer. In terms of cash flow, is that the only thing that happens? It isn't because we have accounts receivable and accounts payable on either side of what's going on with the factory. So in order to determine how long a dollar takes to move through AR and accounts payable, we need to go back to the income statement and balance sheet and add some more information to what we know, right? We know the factory is 15 weeks, but we have to adjust for the fact that we have to also purchase things, right? So that's our accounts payable, right? We're buying things, but we haven't paid for them yet. <clears throat> And, oh, by the way, we've sold things, our accounts receivable, but we haven't collected the money from our customer yet. So if we're interested in how long a dollar takes, we have to take a look at those things. Okay? All right. So we're going to go back to the statement of income. <clears throat> okay? From the income statement, we can find the throughput for accounts receivable. What do you think the throughput for accounts receivable might be? Net sales. Net sales, right? That's exactly where our, our we have to bill the customer, right? And so if we have net sales of 250 million per year, that's going to be our accounts receivable throughput. Okay. On that same note, then let's go to the next slide. Okay, and we have our balance sheet. We can determine the amount of current accounts receivable and the amount of current accounts payable. So what's our current accounts receivable? Liabilities. Yep. It's the receivables. Yep, it's the receivables. So there's our current accounts receivable. Let's see. And then I think it's all the way at the bottom, kind of, we throw in the payables, right? So that's our current accounts payable. So that's how much we currently have in payables and currently have in receivables. What is that? Inventory, throughput, or flow time? Inventory, because it's a snapshot in time, right? We're just looking at it, and we're assuming that this is a good average of what we have, okay? <coughs> All right, so now we've got our inventory for accounts receivable and accounts payable, and we have our throughput for um, accounts receivable from net sales, okay? So we're gonna need throughput then for payables, right? And I can go back to my cost of goods sold and get my throughput for payables, right? So what in this, I'm not talking, we're not going to be talking about inventory, but in our cost of goods sold, right, that's the dollars per year that we spend, where do we have accounts payable in there? Where are we paying for things? Raw materials and purchase parts. Raw materials and purchase parts. The fabrication and the assembly is all internal, right? That's happening inside the factory. But raw materials and purchase parts, we are actually buying them from a third party, okay? So that becomes our throughput, 50.1 plus 40.2 for our purchase parts, okay? All right. So we have 90.3 when we add those two together for throughput. And so it's just making sure that you're looking at, again, this cost of goods sold and recognizing that everything in there isn't billed to a third party vendor, but we can pick out the items that are raw materials and purchase parts. Okay. So wherever it has the labor and overhead, you're pretty clear that that's happening inside the factory walls. Okay. All right. And so now <clears throat> I can come and I can say, well, let's calculate our flow time for accounts receivable. So in the accounts receivable process, we have on average 27.9 million in inventory in the process, right? Flowing through the process, we have 250 million per year. So therefore, I can say that it takes roughly 5.8 weeks for a dollar to flow through the accounts receivable process, right? So, <clears throat> so in the accounts receivable process, I have purchased and paid for the product, but I haven't been paid for it yet. So am I adding that to my 15 weeks in terms of how long it takes for a dollar to be converted? Zach's saying yes, and he's right. 
We're adding that to. So our accounts receivable is a delay in us receiving payment, right? <clears throat> so we have to add that to our 15 weeks, okay? What about accounts payable, right? I am getting product from a third party, but I don't have to pay for it right away. So am I going to be adding that or subtracting that from the total time it takes for the dollar to flow through my system? Subtracting. I get to subtract that, right? So it's going to be our um, factory plus our accounts receivable minus our accounts payable gives us that really good snapshot of how long it takes a, a dollar to flow through the system. So in this case for our accounts payable, right, we got our $90.3 million from our cost of goods sold for those two uh, third-party purchases that we saw. And we're going to divide that by our average accounts payable of $11.9 million. And that shows us that it takes 6.9 weeks from the time that we purchase material till we pay for it. Okay, so that's a benefit to our cash flow. So we say we have 15 weeks in production, we have 5.8 weeks in accounts receivable, and we subtract out 6.9 weeks for accounts payable, and that leaves us with 14.1 weeks. Okay. Interestingly enough, that's a fairly um, common way that. Uh, companies are, are looked at, right? This is a dated slide. I've, I've told myself I'm going to find a more current one, and I just haven't. Um, but back in 2000, you know, you can see different industries and in, in terms of their cash-to-cash -cash cycle times. Best in class was 31.3 weeks. Average was 120.2 weeks, right? Think of the difference that that would take in terms of investment that you would need to have, right? Computers, best in class was 27.5. Average was 62.1. Okay. Um, electronic equipment, best in class, 31.6. Average was 116.3. All right. Um, so again, I think if you're trying to identify places where you could improve things, right, if you look at this and you're on the downside of that, right, you're having to hold a whole bunch of cash just to support the fact that you're not efficient in terms of how you're turning your dollars. All right. So let's look at how can we figure out where we might want to see some improvement. So we can take that information that we just found, right, and we can take a look at, so this is that process, right? We said where we had 50.1 year, 50.1 million dollars per year flowing into the process for um, the raw materials and fabrication part of it. We have the inventory inside each of those, right, of how much we had. We have 40.2 million per year flow, flowing through for what we needed for bases. Okay. And again, you see at the, at the end of it where we have the 175.8 million that's coming out on the other, other side. So when we expand that detail of our process, we can look at each area in terms of throughput, inventory, and flow time. Okay. And so um, note how, again, when I draw the diagrams, I put the throughput on the arrows showing that they're going through the system, and I put the inventory inside the box, and I just know when I look at that, that what's inside the box is inventory, what is, if it's listed as a flow unit, okay, and what's listed on the arrows coming through the process, that's going to be the throughput. And if you can do your diagrams that way, you're going to keep yourself a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more on the straight and narrow. Okay, so here then we've now broken it out and we've said, <clears throat> okay, well, I know that I had 6.5 million in raw materials. I know that I had 50.1 million per year in throughput, and I divide that by 50 or 52 weeks. I'm not sure which we did. And it tells me that I have 0.96 million per week in throughput there. And my average flow time then is 6.75 weeks, right? So now I can go through this process stage by stage and say, in raw materials and fabrication, purchase parts, assembly, finished goods, and accounts receivable, where do I have the most investment and the most time, okay? And if I were gonna say, Opportunity-wise, okay, you could say that um, I could look at the largest dollars of throughput is in accounts receivable, right? I have $4.81 million per week going through accounts receivable. So if I could improve my accounts receivable from 5.8 weeks to 4.8 weeks, I'm going to free up $4.81 million in cash. That probably matters, right? On the other hand, I could also look at purchase parts where it takes 11.12 weeks, which is the longest flow time that I have, right? And I could say, well, that's some low-hanging fruit. 
Maybe I could reduce that from 11 weeks. Maybe I could pull out three weeks, and that's going to be 0.77 million per week times three, right? And so you're kind of, it gives, do you see how it gives you this kind of um, roadmap to say, here's where our largest opportunities lie, okay? And they've done a good job in the text of then creating a chart that has time across the bottom and flow rate going up the side so that you can really kind of visualize where you have the most opportunity. And again, you can see 11.12 in purchase parts. Boy, that looks like maybe there ought to be able to be some improvement there. And if you, again, if you say, well, you know, accounts receivable is our biggest bang for the buck in terms of how much we have flowing through that in a week, if we can make that improvement, how much better off would we be? Okay. So based on that, um, let's say, let's do, let's come back to this just for a quick second. All right. And so our throughput for finished goods and assembly is 3.38 million a week for finished goods and assembly, okay? So if that's the case, if I improved finished goods by one week, how much cash am I freeing up? Three point three eight, right? So that's the connection I wanna make sure that you're making, right? If I can reduce the flow time by one week, I'm freeing up that amount of cash that's flowing through there in that week, okay? All right. I think the visual model makes it easier to see and communicate to others, right? I think that um, we started here, and I don't think probably any of you were getting much from that, right? But when you translate that information, you kind of need that to be able to translate that information into your chart and then, again, into this graph, all right? Flow time in each department represents the amount of time a cost dollar spends on average in the department. Reducing flow time, therefore, reduces the requirement for working capital. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at a couple of quick problems. So problem of 3.3 from the text on page 76. We're going to uh, checking accounts at a local bank carry an average balance of $3,000. Inventory, throughput, or flow time? Inventory. The bank turns over its balance six times per year. On average, how many dollars flow through the bank each month? Okay? So we're not quite given a straightforward flow time, but we can calculate it. If the bank turns over its balance six times per year, right, I can calculate, um, well, I guess let's, let's follow the slide here. What information is it asking for us to solve? How many dollars flow through the bank each month? So we're talking about inventory throughput or flow time? Throughput. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, what did you say, Rachel? Um, what did you say? Throughput. Throughput, it's because it's flow through the bank each month, so dollars per month, okay? And so what information do we have? Well, we have inventory, right? And so we need to see, can we figure out time? Because we know we're going to be solving for throughput from our, it turns over its bank balance six times per year. And we can, okay? And so we can say that... Um, in terms of flow time can be also calculated as uh, one over turns, okay? And that's a formula that comes from our textbook. So flow time is equal to one over inventory turns, okay? So um, my flow time is one over six times per year, okay? And if I convert that to months by taking one over six times per year times um, 12 months, that's going to be two, that leaves me with two months, okay? Yeah, Kayla? Will you add this problem onto the PowerPoint? Because on the PowerPoint, it's problem 3.11 on page 78. It's a different problem on the... That's the next problem. And so this one isn't on there? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I will. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Huh. Huh, she said... Okay, so I will add this problem, all right? And so, again, remember that formula that flow time is equal to 1 over turns, okay? And so that gives us two months. So now I've got inventory and flow time, and I can calculate my throughput, which is $3,000 in inventory divided by two months, gives me $1,500 per month, okay? All right. 
Uh, problem 311 from page 78 of the text. ABC Corporation's consolidated income statement and balance sheet for years 2011 and 2012 are shown in thousands of dollars, and I've got it on the next slide. How do you think cash flow performance in 2011 compares with that of 2012 in the factory as well as in accounts receivable? And do you think 2012 is an improvement over 2011 and why? Okay. So here's our information, right? Um, we have net revenues, cost of goods sold. We have our current assets and cash, inventories, and accounts receivable. And based on what we just learned, right? Uh, based on what we just learned, it's gonna, I'll do it like this again. We can calculate our factory flow time is our inventory divided by our throughput, okay? And our inventory in terms of um, the factory flow time, so we're going to do this for 2011, right? Our inventory is 20,880, okay? Mm -hmm. And our throughput, again, Kaylin, you're the one that told us last time, comes from our net revenues, right? So I'm gonna take my inventory and divide it by my throughput, okay? And that's going to give me my flow time. Sorry, let me swap again. of 0.2168 years, okay? In 2012, my factory flow time is again gonna be inventory divided by throughput, and we can see inventory is 25,200, throughput is 110,644, right? And so then that tells us then that we have 0.2562 years is our flow time. So from 2011 to 2012, did our factory flow time Sorry, 2011, our factory flow time was 0.2144 per year, and in 2012, it was 0.2562 per year. So did we improve or disimprove based on flow time? 2011, 0.2144 of a year. 2012, 0.2562 of a year. Disimproved. We disimproved. Our accounts receivable, then we're going to take our accounts receivable, comes from our accounts receivable balance, right? of 21,596, and we're going to divide that by, again, our total sales of 99,621. I'm sorry, I led you astray earlier. In our factory flow time, we're going to do inventory of 20,880 divided by the costs of goods sold that run through that. When we're on accounts receivable, we're taking the accounts receivable inventory and dividing it by the net revenues. Okay. And so we make that comparison, and we go from accounts receivable of basically 0.22 of a year to 0.21 of a year. So improved or disimproved? 0.22 of a year in 2011 to 0.21 of a year in 2012. Improved. Improved, right? We're, we're less flow time is better. So performance in the factory has worsened while that in AR is improved. So overall, net income has increased so that at the aggregate corporate level, we have an improvement. Okay? Based on these calculations, where do you think they should focus their efforts to regain improvement at the factory level? Getting paid for their stuff. So they have cash on hand instead of just cash receivable, wouldn't it be? So we're seeing, what were you going to say, Rachel? So we're at the factory level. Where should I focus my improvement? So some of it is... Oh, so on a factory level? Yeah. I don't have anything with collecting money, so wouldn't it be to improve their inventories? You got it, right? So at the okay. factory level, their inventories are high here. So that's what they need to work on is how do I reduce my inventories, okay? So again, that's the kind of logic you're, you're going to need to start kind of creating. Okay, so if I want to improve this measure, so pay attention to the what, are my, what are my opportunities? What? So pay attention to the questions so it's not a corporate level, it's a right. factory level. Right, which is, which is fine. I, I think, um, I really feel like you guys are following along pretty well. I've had, like I said, I think every time we teach it, every time I teach it, it get, go, 